Good evening or good morning to everyone who's in California, for example. Um, the the uh, the weather here is very Californian. Again, we're having an incredible spell of weather in England. I hope you guys have been enjoying yourselves. Um, welcome to what is actually the tenth episode now of Food for Thought live series, and I'm so grateful to you all for your support and encouragement and enthusiasm, and all of you guys who've been watching the broadcasts and and joining me for these incredible interviews with these inspiring people that we've been lucky enough to have on as guests and tonight's no exception but before we get into that and we will get into it soon because i know that you guys are dying to meet my guest tonight but i wanted to take an opportunity to mention something which i've seen two or three times recently mentioned on social media which i think is important it seems to be a sign that it needs to be uh, reiterated so let me do that now is the season for deer to have their baby so there's lots of newborn fawns being born as we speak, which is wonderful. Now, the thing about a newborn fawn is that unlike a giraffe or perhaps a zebra or other animals that you might find in the, in the African wilderness, for example, where they have to be literally able to stand up and walk the moment they're born, which they can, to evade predators, that's not the case with a newborn fawn. And in the case of a fawn, the mother will often leave it for hours on end um, while she goes to feed, and also it's a distraction for predators. So the babies are incredibly camouflaged. Uh, they're, they're absolutely safe, uh, generally speaking, and, and, it's, and it's done by design. It's done deliberately by the mother. So um, if you were to find a newborn fawn in your garden or in a field or somewhere unusual, because they, ha they do happen to give birth to fawns in some of the most unexpected places. I just saw a photograph today of a fawn literally nestled under the patio furniture in so on someone's patio in their garden. And it is unable to stand and it would appear to be abandoned and, and appear to need help, but it absolutely doesn't. And not just that, but it's crucially important that it doesn't get interfered with because if the mother comes back and smells human scent, she may well abandon it because of that. So if you happen to see a newborn fawn, please leave it alone. Keep an eye on it, of course, but don't, don't touch it. So I just thought I'd take the opportunity to mention that. Um, so let's get to uh, let's get to tonight's guest. Um, it's for me uh, now. I, I know that my my guest tonight doesn't um, doesn't appreciate being fawned upon. <laughs> no pun intended. Having just talked about fawn, but um, this is an honour for me. This is a great honour, and we heard from her son last week, uh, and and about their wonderful foundation. And it is my great privileged to be a patron for the Born Free Foundation and to welcome you tonight, Virginia McKenna. Hello. <laughs> How lovely to see you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm thrilled to bits. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's exciting bit, isn't it? When you're not quite sure what's coming yep. next. I've no idea. I've no idea what's going to happen either. But let's just see how it goes. And you, you, when we were chatting, you have a story about a fawn yourself, don't you? Yes, which it reminded me your your story, which is a sad one, really. Um, mine's a little different. Um, it was 1969, a long time ago. We'd made a film in Scotland called Ring of Bright Water about an otter from the book by Gavin Maxwell. And in the film, um, I had a dog um, called Johnny, and who was a Springer Spaniel. And he was belonged in the kennels. He didn't belong to anyone. He was just a kennel dog. And I said, if he's got to be my dog in the film, he needs to live with us. He needs to come and live with us in the house and be part of the family. And that's what happened. He came up and he lived with us. And at the end, my husband Bill and I said, we can't actually leave Johnny. We love him too much. So we bought Johnny. And Johnny came back here to where I live in Surrey. And one day in the ne next year, in the spring, um, I was here in the kitchen, the door was open, and Johnny suddenly appeared with his fawn in his mouth. So gentle, though he didn't hurt it at all. And obviously what had happened, as you've just described, the mother had gone off to feed, left the fawn sort of hiding in, in the woods near us, and, um, and of course Johnny found her and brought her back, or him actually, and um, so we went back and we put the little fawn sort of where we thought John had found, found it, uh, but the mother never returned. And so we brought the fawn in 
and I made a little pen in the kitchen. Um, and I got up, I think it was every four hours or so to feed and give food and all the rest of it through the night. And that went on for quite a long time when actually he grew rather large for the, um, for the kitchen. <laughs> and so we, we, we made a pen in the garden, a lovely garden pen with a shelter and bushes so he could lie in the shade. And then he got too big for that really and he was alone, I couldn't bear it. So I found a, a gentleman who was a, a warden of a wild area in Cannock Chase up north. And I got in touch with him and I told him the story. And I said, is there any chance that you would be able to have Bambi um, in your woodland? And he said, absolutely. So they came down, two, two of them came down with a lovely comfy crate and all the rest of it. Well, I don't know how comfy it was, but anyway, a proper crate to take him, took him and he thrived. He was in a natural forest and he was just, he lived for a long, 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 long oh, time. Wonderful. So. He did have a second chance at life, not totally free, but pretty well almost free because of the other deer in the forest as well. So he had friends. Well, that's wonderful and, and a beautiful story. And it's, uh, it's as you just, you, you just mentioned, uh, cl as close to free as possible. And that's mm. one of the great things. And we'll talk about this as we get to, further into our conversation. We're going to talk about just what an incredible job that you and Born Free do at giving animals as, as close to freedom as they can get, even if freedom is an impossibility through through our own human actions um, so we'll, and we'll talk about that but you um, you have got your own stories dating back through your life that got you started with interest in animals and lions in particular and we've had a conversation about some one of your earliest experiences with uh, with lions when you were very young can you can you give us a little uh, insight into that yes I, I only thought of this this morning actually because i thought where did it all begin and we've always said oh it began with going out to make born free which is of course became the beginning of the rest of our lives but long 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 time before that i was actually about five and um i lived with my father my parents were divorced and separated and i lived with him and he liked to go to london zoo um, not that I particularly go to London Zoo for enjoyment, I have to say now, or and have for many years. But in those days when I was five, of course, I didn't know anything about these things. And I distinctly remember the experience, aged five, of going into the lion house. There was no outdoor area as there is now in London Zoo and has been for many years. But you... You had to open this huge, heavy, clangy door, go in, and there was this row, I think four or five cages with cement floors, with grown lambs, one in each, pacing, pacing up and down. And, and it was the clang of the door as it shut, and the pacing of the lions, and the, and the smell of captivity. It, it had a smell of captivity. It wasn't disgusting, but it was a different smell, not like freedom. And then, of course, the clang of the door on the other side as we left. So that was my first experience of wild creatures in cages. And the second was when I was 10, um, when the war started in 1939-40, my mother and I sailed to South Africa for the war on a, on a ship. Um, filled with mothers and children. It was just mothers and children coming away from the bombing. And um, I made a friend at the school I went to outside Cape Town, very, very lovely girl. And um, she, her family were very kind to me and uh, invited me to go to Kruger National Park one weekend. They were going on safari. And um, I said, oh, I'd absolutely love to. And then that was my second image, which was the other side of the coin that I'd seen in London, this was free lions, three free lions sitting under an enormous tree in the shade in Kruger. And we stopped the vehicle, of course, and sat there and looked at them for ages. And I thought, this, this is how wild animals should live, not in cages, in concrete cages in captivity. And so these, 
these two images have never left me. And in a way, as I just said, it was the, in a way that the real story of what we do is based on those early memories that I have. It's just so, so incredible to hear that, that here we are having the conversation we're having and, 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 and around the, the Born Free Foundation, which is, of course, your creation in... in well, not me alone. Bill, Bill, of course. Yes, and, um, yes. and, and the, it literally stems back to when you're five years old, ten years old, and those, those thoughts and feelings and beliefs systems starting to get firmed up yes. in you. It's incredible. It's incredible, and and we're gonna. I, I I've, I'm so happy that you're here to share with us the story of how this has evolved for you. And um, I'm also so happy to tell you, as you know, because he's just he's only just left uh, the room there with you. That Will is uh, Will is of course online uh, and watching, and so he, he may not be aware of what's what's about to be popped up on screen. But when you talked about you being five years old, I happen to know <laughs> that in this photograph, oh. Mr. Will Travers is is five years old. There he is. Yeah, this was in London at the at the at the on, in the docks, on the Durban Castle. We were about to sail from Mombasa, which took I think between two and three weeks in those days. It was a long journey, and our three children we had then. We've got we had then another one. We have four, and um, Will in the middle, of course, the tallest, and my daughter Louise on the left, the little girl. And then Justin, who was really only about one and a quarter or something, uh, near Bill's knee, and uh, off we sailed. And we, we spent virtually the whole journey reading about lions because we didn't know anything about lions whatsoever. And we thought we'd better be a bit clued up. Well, nothing really prepares you for actually meeting them, but we ought to know a little bit about what kind of animals they are and what their nature is. Mm. And their family life, which of course is very important for for lions, for predators, and, and big cats, and um, so we we spent most of the time reading about lions, and the children had a lovely time playing on deck, and they, they didn't seem to mind. It was a long sea trip, so um, we got there, and and then it all began really. So this literally is when you her, you arrived in was it where, where, is it Mombasa? This was, this was leaving London. This was leaving London. Mombasa. And then we caught the train from Mombasa to Nairobi. And I think we had, I think we had a night, I can't actually remember now, I'm afraid, but um, we may have had a night in Nairobi just to sort of recover from everything. And, uh, and then we moved to um, a little, uh, which was then a small, uh, smallish little country town called Nanuki, which is where we first lived. And then we went to a place called Narumoru, which is where we made the film. And, uh, the journey from where we lived to Neary was quite a long journey. We used to leave at about six o'clock in the morning and get home about six at night. And so they very quickly, the producers found us um, a house, an old settler's house in the bush near the location, right along the, the track from where the lions lived in their compounds. And we had our compound and our, tr and our little, you know, very nice actually settler's house on, the, on a little river where um, we lived happily with Harax and all sorts of wild creatures coming through the garden. And that's where we lived when we made the film. How amazing. And had you, had you met the Adamsons prior to this or was this the first time you were going to meet them? No, 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 never, never. We because... went, of course, avidly, but we'd never met either of them. And oh, here we are with them. George, wonderful George, who became one of our closest and dearest friends. And the irony of it, this whole thing with the Adamsons and their wonderful work they each did to, to help wild animals that had you know, problems, had been removed from their families or needed returning to the wild. And Joy did a lot with Cheetah and, and Penny the Leopard, of course, um, and George more or less stuck to land. Um, but it was a very, very amazing relationship, really. Um, George, as I said, became one of our dearest friends until he was murdered. He was murdered in Cora, mm. in next to Meru, and uh, where Elsa the Lioness is buried in Meru National Park, then called Reserve, not National Park. And Joy <clears throat> moved to Shaba because she was then starting her work rehabilitating Penny the Leopard. And um, 
and she was also murdered. You see, everyone said, oh, they'll be killed by leopards. Oh, they'll be killed by lions. No, no, killed by the most dangerous species of all, and that's us. For sure, hmm. yeah. It's a kind of a twisted irony, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. it's, it's tragic. And, and so, of course, through this experience, you became such great friends, as you say. And how, how, how long were you in, in, the, in Kenya filming Born Free? Um, well, it must have been about 10, 10 and a half months or a little more, because what happened was that um, before we started filming, we had two months getting to know the animals we had to work closely with. Mm. Uh, we, we had over 20, or about 22 lambs altogether, um, including little cubs. Three little cubs from Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. Uh, <laughs> and then all, all sizes of, uh, of lions. Uh, two from the Scots Guards Regiment, which was based in Nairobi, or in Girl, they were called, or other imaginatively, and Mara, who had been a pet in someone's house as a cub and then became too dangerous for the children, so she was sent to the Nairobi Animal Orphanage, and Ugus, a very big male who was in the orphanage, and little Elsa, who was adorable, who played Elsa when she was quite small. And um, unfortunately, um, I don't know, no, I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit too far. Um, we had to um, get to know some of the lands that we work closely with. Yeah. And we had a very nice um, German trainer, circus trainer, who was our teacher, and she did extremely well. Not that we liked circuses, but nevertheless, we had to know how to be with the lions safely. And we had to wear these big leather, leather wrist guards on our wrists when we were in the training uh, period in the compound. And uh, we had to hold, we had two little sticks, which we held in different positions and the lions understood exactly what we meant, how we positioned the sticks. It was absolutely fascinating. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing actually. Do you, are there any particularly fond or vivid memories for you of, of, the, of the process of filming Born Free? Is there anything that stands out? I mean, the whole experience the must have been incredible. The whole, sorry, what did you say? I said the whole experience must have been incredible, but... It was incredible in all sorts of different ways. Um, the ones that we, the lands that we had to know well, because we did very close contact scenes with them and swimming in the sea, that was Mara. Uh, running on the beach, that was Girl. Uh, everyone, every land had its thing it liked to do best, so you use that land for that. But our safety, the main thing, our safety was we had to see the lands we were going to work closely with every single day. Right. Um, so we went out on the planes in the morning with them for about an hour and a half to let, so they let off their energy. So when we went into the, onto the set, everyone was in their positions to start filming and uh, the energy of the land had been dispersed. So that was good news. And George was in charge of absolutely everything. He knew totally how to encourage and persuade uh, the lamb to do the things that the, that the camera needed. It was absolutely remarkable, his uh, affinity with the animals. And, and just as well, really, when you look at this kind of image here. Yes, that's boy and girl on the Land Rover. There you go. Yes. It's, it's, um, Actually, boy, boy um, when we were doing our training session, <laughs> Uh, before filming started, Bill and I were out on the planes with them on our own. There wasn't anyone with us. And just ahead of us, there was a little group of Thompson's gazelle. And both the lands got terribly worked up and excited at seeing them. And they started to stalk them and um, crawling along like this. And um, Bill said, I think they'd like us to stalk with them. I said, oh, OK. So we got down on our knees and we're sort of going through the grass and it was so prickly I stood up and rubbed my knees because they were all scratched through my trousers actually and boy who by then was in a huge state of excitement turned around and saw me and he took off and he jumped on me plonk onto my shoulders and um, I fell over and my ankle broke unfortunately which was oh, rather a nuisance yes and um, anyway um, 
Bill then had the challenge of actually getting the two animals back into the Land Rover so that he could drive us back to camp. And he managed to get boy, I think it was, in, and girl went on top or the other way around. I can't actually quite remember. And then mm. he came and carried me and took me to the Land Rover. And then I had to drive to Nairobi, which is about 130 kilometers, mm. hospital for a couple of weeks. And, um, and, and my leg was fixed. It was fine. Came out wearing a plaster and, and a huge great boot they made me to go over the plaster. And, um, and then the most wonderful thing happened. I was driven up to camp um, in the car, obviously, um, and Boy and George, um, Bill and George were coming back from taking the lands for a walk, let off steam. And I wound the window of the car down and called Boy, and he looked up, he remembered my voice, and he came and put half his body through the window of the car, which I'd wound down, and gave me such a greeting. So, I mean, I knew that he hadn't meant to knock me over. <laughs> He was just too excited, you know. And of course, after that, it was fine. No problems. <laughs> and it's wonderful, you know. It's it's an amazing thing to see this this kind of image here, where that's you... Mara. That's Mara, who was in the Nairobi orphanage. Right. And she was quite. Uh, she was quite a lot older than than the other lands. She must have been about sixteen, eighteen months when she came to us. So she was pretty big, and. Um, her story is not a happy one, unfortunately. We absolutely loved her. And she did all the swimming in the sea scenes because the girl who we took to swim couldn't bear the water. So mm. Lara did all the swimming scenes. It was fantastic. But at the end of the film, when all the lands were going to be sold off, except the three we managed to save, um, the Adamsons and ourselves, um, she was sent to Whipsnade mm. with little Elsa, with the small one. Those two went to Whipsnade and Bill was so, he was so incensed by the whole way that they were, in a way, they were sort of abandoned. I mean, I suppose everyone thought they were going to a nice happy zoo or something. But they'd been stars of the film and here we were locking them up. Um, so he decided this story was going to be the subject of his very first documentary he ever made called The Lions Are Free. And George, of course, was in it. And the lions, I, I had to go to Whipsnade and stand and look at Mara and little Elsa and call them. And of course, they came running when they heard my voice and um, couldn't, we, I couldn't touch them. It, it was heartbreaking. It really was. So it was it a be. mix of joy for the three lions that we managed to save and great, great sadness for all the rest that we couldn't. Which, which I guess it became a somewhat of a driving force for you, didn't it? In the sense that, in fact, I've got a photograph of that as well. Let me share it was because I think this is the same oh, lion we just saw you with at Whipsnade. That's Mara, yes. So the same exact. I mean, that's the that's the part of what had such an impact. That yes. is the same lion. From that to that, yeah, and you can see her whole body language is so sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. Well, I've seen quite a few sad animals in zoos, but I don't, of course, uh, know them in the way that I knew Mara. Yeah, it's it's again something we spoke about last week with Will was was the 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 ethos of Born Free uh, in in so much as compassionate conservation, where every single individual matters. And as you've just said, you don't know them, but you'll still fight for them uh, just as yes. hard. And it's it's a beautiful part of. The born free, born free philosophy and and uh, ethos. I think it's beautiful, um, and it's not just lions either, either is it? Let's tell, tell tell me about this little beauty. Little elephant. This was in Kenya. This is a little elephant called Poli Poli, which means slowly, slowly. And we were out there to, in 1968 to make another film uh, directed by James Hill, who was the director of Born Free. They, Bill and he did quite a few films together. And um, for our story, we, we needed a, a, a young elephant. And Daphne and David Sheldrick, David Sheldrick was actually the warden of Sabo National Park when we were there. And they had, Daphne and David had two rescued elephants, but they were teenagers and we needed a little one. And um, we asked around and then we were told that in the trapper's yard in Nairobi, there was this 
little elephant that had just been taken from the wild from her family as a gift to London Zoo. Oh. And so we went, I said to David, could we, could we go and, and see? So we went down with him and we went down and saw her. And this little darling elephant was in a kind of fenced stockade yard thing. And she was so frightened. She was so terrified. It was heartbreaking. And I said to David, I, I, I don't see how we can possibly use her in the film. She's too frightened. He said, if you let me be with her for two or three days, I will calm her and you will be able to. And that's exactly what happened. So what you see there is the result of David's knowledge and Daphne's understanding of this species and many others, but particularly elephants. As just as a slight diversion, as you may know, Daphne then started her wonderful elephant orphanage outside Nairobi, where so many elephants are still brought and, and uh, one of her daughters um, looks after them and, you know, they are returned to the world eventually, or safety anyway. Anyway, Poli Poli um, was the star of the film. And then we just adored her and asked if we could buy her at the end and give her to the Sheldricks. And they said, yes, yes, of course, yeah, you can. I can't remember how much they were going to charge us, but that didn't seem to be um, a problem just at that moment because the problem was they said, oh, but if, if you buy her, we'll have to capture another. Oh. The, the, the gift is a promise. So uh, we absolutely, it was one of the worst moments of our life, I think, because we, we knew we couldn't allow another one to be torn from its family and a whole, whole lot of lives wrecked again. So she did come to London Zoo. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, this is, this is how it ended up for her, looking as you described to me when we looked at this together before, this is her swaying with stress. Yeah, she has stereotypic behavior. She had broken off one tusk completely and almost the whole of the other one. And uh, she was a very, very sad, I'm sorry, Sight, she really was. And we decided that we had to do something. And I, I'm going to share what is probably one of the most iconic photos uh, when we talk about the evolution of the Born Free Foundation, which is this incredible moment. Can you tell us what's just happened here? Well, <clears throat> as I told her, she came uh, to us in Africa in 1968 and then came to London Zoo. And this photograph is taken in 1983. And we went to London Zoo with a newspaper because we told them what we were going to try and do. And she was pacing up and down, up and down, up and down. And she, um, we called her and she came. She recognized our voices. She came and touched our hands. It was just horrendous. I still can't bear it to this day, to be honest with you. Um, but that was it. We said, okay, this is it. We're going to absolutely do something. I found a reserve in South Africa who would love her to come. I found someone who knew all about elephants to take her, who would uh, uh, teach her and, and prepare her for joining an elephant group and all the rest of it. And um, they, uh, we were told, no, you can't do any of those things. So but what we will do, they said, we will move her to Whipsnade. There are countries where there are more elephants and she will have companionship. So what could we say? At least you'd have companionship. So right. the crate, the traveling crate was put outside the door of the inner quarters of the elephant house for a, for a good week or two. I mean, properly done. It was properly done. I can't fault that. And she was fed in there. So you got used to going in and out. Sometimes they'd shut the thing for a bit and then she'd go in and then open it and she'd go out again. Come the actual day, she, she went in and they shut it and they left her standing there for many, many, many hours and she collapsed. And I have a photograph, which I haven't put up here, but um, I have a photograph of someone from the army who came with a jack and he had to use a jack to get her up onto her feet again so that she could be led into the in a elephant house where she was sedated, her foot was examined that they said she damaged it. Her foot was examined 
And then we were told that she'd lost the will to live. She couldn't get up and they put her down. And it was her death that started Zuchek in 1984. That was when we started our tiny little charity sitting around my dining room table here. Just. So that, this was an incredibly poignant moment and, and, the, and what unfolded as you've just beautifully described. And thank you so much for sharing that with us because I realize that that's obviously a very a profoundly moving experience and, and, and a, it's changed the trajectory of your whole life since then. Yes, it has. Quite For incredible. Years, aren't I lucky? Oh, I just... Aren't we lucky? Aren't we? Well, I mean, you don't know what life's going to bring, do you? And it's just as well, quite frankly. But sometimes it's total joy. Sometimes it's relief. Sometimes it's agony and pain. But it's the whole mix of life. And you have to deal with each thing as it comes. And here we were painfully given a painful gift of the death of an animal we cherished so much that it led hopefully to better lives for many many other animals that came our way over the subsequent many years till today and still doing it <laughs> and, and it so that's wonderful it, it really is and it's really it's really fascinating to hear you talk about this and to hear your story of that moment or those that series of things the cumulative effect of leading you to this this life that you've led since then and and I, it reminds me of something which um i think you and i went both actually went to the the premiere of to the moon and back the film about jill robinson who set up animals yes. asia and you yes, were, yes. Oh, it's amazing hearing you talk about what inspired you to to yeah. do what you've done because i now i know that not only have you created uh, along with will and bill born free and everything that has been achieved but you've also inspired Jill Robinson to create Animals Asia because it was you that told her you've got to you've got to try you've got to do it because you and you knew from experience which is why you were able to give her that advice that's absolutely right because um, I met Jill in Hong Kong many many years ago and we, we just clicked we just became very close friends and still are and I was in my little office in my shed in the garden one day and the phone rang and it was Jill and she said, I don't quite know what to do. I said, what is it? And so she told me the story about she, she'd had this experience in a ghastly uh, moon bear hell hole and, and all these bears in these terrible cages. And I've been mm. to so I know what it's like. And um, this bear put his paw out between the bars of its cage and touched her arm. And I mean, you know, what would you do? It was like Pearly Pearly touching us with her trunk. I said, you haven't any choice. You, you must do it. If you fail, you've tried, but you must try. I knew she'd win because she just wouldn't give up. I knew she wouldn't give up. And she's got these two fantastic sanctuaries now, one in China, one in Vietnam. And I, I've been to both and I'm one of their patrons and I'm so honored to be that. But most of all, we are very, very close friends. And when she comes to the UK, sadly, no one can at the minute. But when she next comes, she's going to come and stay. Mm. How wonderful. And I'm very happy to tell people, uh, and yourself included, Virginia, that Jill has also agreed to be a guest on this series. And so we'll be hearing ah. from her directly. Oh, I'm going to email her later. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Oh, I'm her my love. Please send her my love. I um, will indeed. Of course I will. And just before we move on, I want to just point out there's some lovely comments um, coming in um, uh, uh, all, all the way through. There's there's literally hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of comments coming through from adoring um, followers and supporters and fans. And uh, one of which Darren uh, Coombs has just uh, said he would love to help free these elephants. What can I do to help? And, I, and I'm happy to. You don't have to answer that question because Will is uh, very kindly providing answers as we go through because he's also commenting and I'll share those comments on screen for you guys. But just because because Darren's asked that question and thank you, sir, for asking uh, and prompting me to say this, you know, we have to remember as we go through this fascinating story, which we're all gripped by, that there's work to be done. And the, the way we can do that work is to go to uh, Born Free, uh, go to the website, go to the Facebook page, the Twitter page, the Instagram page, follow along. Get, get involved in their campaigns, donate if you can. Um, and we realize that times are tough at the moment, but you know, 
right that for, for, for that reason alone we we need help more than ever um so um that's how you can help darren and thank you for asking and as you'll see that will's will will continue to uh, provide some input as to some of those questions and i'll try and share them if i see them however uh, back to to you virginia with the with the incredible way that things and and heartbreaking way that things unfolded for for you with poli poli and as you say the her um unfortunate very unfortunate and heartbreaking end and as you say that was the moment that you became absolutely determined that this wasn't okay and that captivity wasn't something you were going to tolerate anymore and we've got a series of photographs which which you've shared with me to share with everybody else which kind of illustrate exactly what you're referring to with captivity I mean, what do these images mean to you as we go through them well i mean it's 2020 isn't it and we're still seemingly think it's fine to keep wild creatures I and mean, we know a bit about giraffes from even if we've never been to africa we've seen fit wonderful wildlife documentary films we've seen photographs of how they live in the wild mm. and we have well it's the night quarters and i i think that, that these animals probably have an outdoor area but even the outdoor area is a tiny fraction of the, the space that they would need in the wild so i mean for me this is an insult to the this living creature that's incarcerated in that hideous place Hideous is a good word for it. I mean, it, it, to all intents and purposes, if it was if it was you or I in there, it, we would figure we were in prison, wouldn't we? I mean, that's a prison. It's called prison. It is called prison. Right. They're not free, and lack of freedom means you're imprisoned. Even if it's not prison, you're imprisoned. And so, never forget that when you go and everyone says, "Oh, ah, aren't the elephants lovely? Oh, look at the tiger sitting on a rock or something," they're in. A nicer prison than the one that's in that cell with nothing, but they're still in prison. They can never be themselves. They can't choose when they go to bed. They can't choose when they get up in the morning. They can't choose their companions, and sometimes they haven't got any. They can't choose what they eat. They have no choice at all, except for people to come and sometimes laugh at them. And in some countries, apparently, like throw sticks at them. I mean, excuse me, you know, there's no. There's no depth of understanding of what these animals are going through as living creatures in order for the visitor. And there's the dolphin. That's a natural environment, of course, for a dolphin in a uh, cement tank, isn't it? Round and round in a circle every day. And even if, there's a, if it's a dolphinarium and they go out and do tricks, they are trained to do tricks. They don't necessarily want to do those tricks. They have to do those tricks at that time at the time of day or morning, whatever, for the for the visitors that come and pay to see them do tricks. That to me is an abuse of animals. It's a betrayal of the trust that we should be trying to show animals that we love and trust them. We're not lions and, and, and dolphins and giraffe. We're not, but we must respect their nature, that we must, and don't incarcerate them in these fearful places you know which where they have no hope and no future yeah that's and our nearest relatives of course yes <laughs> as a prison if you can call it anything else i would defy you to <laughs> you know it's it's um it reminds me of 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 a comment that will made when he when he joined me last saturday mm. uh, on this on this series that that we hold our freedom so dear to us that it's literally the thing that's used, the taking away of that freedom is what's used against us as punishment if we owe a debt to society. And yet we're prepared to inflict that on these incredible sentient, feeling, emotional beings. Where do you think that disconnect comes from? Where, where do you, where, why do you think that human beings attribute so much importance to the, their own freedom but will willingly in prison, as you quite rightly said, any anything else for their own entertainment and profit? Well, I, I, I must pay tribute to the people who don't think like that. I mean, not every single person in the world thinks like that, but an awful lot, lot too many do. And it's sure. not about that, it's about trophy hunting, killing them for so-called fun, for sport. You know, how dare people go up? I know they pay a lot of money, but it doesn't necessarily go to the community, which is what they always say, not at all. So, I mean, Will can tell you the figures more than I can, but I know that to be true. 
we, we hunt them. We want their skin on the floor or their head on the wall. We want to be able to pay our fee at the zoo gate and go and see this poor sitting in, in, in a nothing world, um, never the, having a chance to choose its life, to choose its companions. Um, the beautiful male gorilla at London Zoo died recently, and I remember going there last year to London Zoo, where, thank God, there are no elephants anymore. But everything else, it's, it is so depressing. I find it so depressing to mm. go and see animals in captivity now, which I'm sure you do too. And the gorilla, they were indoors because it was sort of wintry. And he was just sitting. He was just sitting. And one or two of the small ones were sort of jumping about a bit, but everyone else was just sitting, maybe moving a bit of hay or picking up something and putting it down. I mean, that's not a gorilla. <laughs> that's what we've made those gorillas become prisoners people in humans in prison don't really they have the chance to behave like themselves like they should behave in life because they're in prison they have no expression no possibility of it it's just the same for animals it's no different that, so beautifully put it underlines the preposterousness of any suggestion that you could derive some kind of education about animals and st study of their behavior by s visiting them in a zoo because as you've just said, they have no freedom of choice. They have no, no spirit left. I mean, their spirits are broken. If they're, if they're doing anything, it's usually because of negative reinforcement to ensure that they do it because otherwise they won't be fed. It's, it's staggering. Again, another staggering disconnect. But as you said, and one of the things that I love about you so very much and Born Free is the fact that you will always, you started that by saying, let's pay credit to the people who don't think that way because it's not it's not everybody and as you you quite rightly said that also you know there's far too many people who do think this way but you 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 instill hope in people and and that's i think another very very clear part of the the born free philosophy and and ethos and it comes across in the work that you do and the the, the example that you set and so you know i think you you know while as we go through these horrific images uh, you know, I'm 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 noticing what Will has written. Absolutely, beautifully put. Be angry, be outraged, and then turn your outrage into action. Be the change. I mean, it's beautifully put. If you're not reading these comments from Will, we've literally got that appearing in the in the Facebook feed as we're talking to Virginia here live. So it's a it's an amazing opportunity for us to hear directly from Born Free. And you're, if you weren't familiar with Born Free before this, you'll be starting to see why I adore them so much and why. They have achieved so much because the, the sheer passion with which you speak, Virginia, and that even Will spoke last week and even writes today, it's just, it's truly, truly inspiring. So while we're looking at these images, which are very painful to see, it, it's very important to keep those carry on. Look, 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 how could dare we subject these beautiful, wonderful animals to these hideous lives where they can never be fulfilled? I mean, as, I won't go over it all again because I've just talked about prison, but I mean, you know, we put in pr people in prison where they have to pay a price for something they've done wrong. These have done absolutely nothing wrong, mm. except the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the greed and the ambition of humans who think it's frightfully clever to capture these things and pop them in. I'm not saying every zoo looks like that. That would be incorrect and that would be unfair of me. There are places which have enclosures uh, but the choices are still absolutely minimal and you can see if you go to a zoo and you look at the grass if there's a grass floor if they're lucky you'll see a track usually a track where pace the animals paced round and round and round in the same place on and on until the, the grass has been worn away and you can see look look next time you go to a zoo you can bear to go and have a go with a different eye go with an inquisitive eye not saying oh ah, look at the elephant but oh how terrible look at the elephant have a different approach to what you're seeing because what you're seeing virtually is a prisoner it's, i know that the zoo people are going to want to kill me then if they ever hear what i'm saying but actually i don't care you know because i i stand up for people who for creatures who can't stand up for themselves that's what i want to do for the rest of my days however short or long and I think that's very important. We all must follow what we believe in as long as it's not cruel and unkind. That's what you must do, be generous. 
Um, and again, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for sharing these insights and thoughts with us because it's, I mean, it's very, it's very, I know that there'll be people watching who are being touched deeply by what you're saying and you're, and you're not just saying it, you're living it. You've, you are living, breathing example of what you're talking about because you have dedicated yourself to it and you're still as passionate as ever listening to you talk about it is 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 inspiring in the extreme so you well, know, I, I'm, well i'm inspired by the animals you see we pass on the baton don't we 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 share things and some people are not inspired at all and they say i wish the other thing would shut up you know and that's fine i don't no, I know that I won't persuade many people in the world because they don't think the same way, and then that's their choice. But there are people who, who, are, who are sort of not sure and waiting and think, actually, I, I sort of agree with that. I better go and see for myself. Don't take my word. Go and see for yourself and have a look and see what you experience when you see these animals. And it, as I said earlier, it may be they've got a grassy compound, they've got a a rock or two to climb on, they may have a tree to lie under, forever. Never forget it's forever, unless they're moved to another zoo, of course, to something else for breeding, which is often what happens, um, or they die, you know, or, and animals that live in groups live alone, and animals that live alone live in groups. I mean, you know, you can't really make it up. Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right, you can't, and it's... it's oh, there we got our rhino. We have our rhino. Yeah. Oh. And as you've said, I mean, you, you, you're not suggesting that all zoos look like this, but but nonetheless, no, no. It's, 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 it's an interesting time, isn't it? Because here we all are experiencing probably for the first time in most of our lives, some sort of restriction on our freedom of movement. And, it, and, it's, and we have the, the luxury of knowing it's for our benefit. We have our, the luxury of knowing it's been done to save our lives. And we have the benefit of someone being able to explain that to us and we get to understand and, and comprehend why it's happening. And yet the animals, they ha no one can explain it to them. There's no, they aren't prisoners, so there's no, there's no crime being committed. There's no charges being pressed. There's no one explaining it. And there's no end in sight. Because for us in this, this current situation, we know that it will eventually end, probably quite soon. And it's not that bad even during the time that it is happening. We're all experiencing it right now and, f and people finding it extraordinarily difficult. And yet we'll subject, again, sentient f beings with complex family structures and emotions and feelings to that mm. kind of in, 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 ca in captivity that you're looking at on the screen right now. However, thanks to you and Born Free and, of course, many others, because I know that you're one of your greatest qualities is your humility and you'll you'll always correct me whenever i whenever i whenever well, i don't I say. You, Dan, but there are there are a lot of really wonderful animal welfare organizations who struggle their utmost best to change people's minds and to help the animals we're just one one of that group of people who don't want to just sit and say oh well, isn't that terrible and then open a book we want to do something and there are more Absolutely. and more people particularly young ones who feel like that which is wonderful Absolutely. And once again, Born Free is leading the way, setting a phenomenal example, which we're now going to segue into, which we're going to talk about some of the stories of animals, essentially, in situations like the ones we've just been looking at, but that have happy endings. So I would love for you to talk us through some of these, because these are some examples of where Born Free have stepped in. Well, <clears throat> before we were so wonderfully uh, invited to create a sanctuary in South Africa at Shamwari by Adrian Gardner. Um, we had a small rescue center in Kent and we brought several lambs and tigers there uh, from ghastly places and ghastly beast wagons and circuses. And these two are called Antia and Rafi and they lived in a cage on the roof of a bar in Tenerife for years. The owner of the bar didn't provide them with access to drinking water. This is what we learned. He used to come twice a day w w with a jug and he would pour water, standing on the roof of this cage, he would pour water into the open mouths of the lions who were desperately thirsty in the heat, obviously, 
to drink. We, and I had, I had a file of letters like this from people who were living in flats or on holiday in flats that looked down on this, this cage. And next to it, there was a leopard in a cage by itself. And um, we, wrote, we wrote to the authorities. We read, please, we'd like to take them and look after them. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And then the Mail on Sunday did an absolutely fantastic piece with two reporters who went out and did, I think it was a two page spread. I mean, it was fantastic telling the story. And there was such an outcry that the owner of the zoo and the authorities in Tenerife had to give in. And so our team went out and um, they had to actually saw through the padlock because it had never been open for so long, it had completely rusted up. And they were brought to sanctuary in Kent. And then I just have to look something up. I hope you'll forgive me for a second. Of course I, I will. Of course I will. Names. Uh, I probably haven't even written it down. Um, oh, no, no, I haven't. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. I haven't written his name down. I'm going to describe who he is there. Um, when we brought the lambs to the centre here, the rescue centre here at Kent, uh, it was Thompson Fly Airlines. And one of the people in Thompson Fly met Adrian Gardner, this wonderful man who created Shamwari in, the, in South Africa near Port Elizabeth, and told him the story of these lambs. And he said, he got in touch, they must come here. And here they are at Shamwari. They've left the fowl cage. They've left the little halfway house center here. And they're now at Shamwari. And they died in 2006, but they had the most wonderful, wonderful life. I mean, look at them there. <laughs> they're fine, aren't they? The contrast. And, and so that was a happy ending. You know, everyone's got to go in the end, and they had their time, but they had their, their time ended in peace, contentment, loved by all the team we have at Shambari who were quite wonderful. And, um, well, you've been there, haven't you? I have, and, and yes. you're absolutely right. They're absolutely wonderful angels. They just love the animals so much. They do, and they take and such good care of them. A graveyard for, uh, you, you might have been taken there, beautifully laid out all the animals that die there for whatever reason illness or old age they are buried with a little little sign saying who they are and their lifespan and it's, it's just they're respected you see this is what you have to do respect life not abuse it and not take advantage of it you have to respect it. they've all got feelings for goodness sake of course they do. And we can see that in this picture beautifully. And there yeah. are plenty of examples. This is, you were just talking about Elsa's grave. Oh, yeah. uh, with yourself and Will there. Tell us about that, how, how, how things um, went for Elsa. Well, of course, Elsa only lived till she was five. She died very, very young. And um, she got a, a, a form of tick fever. And she died from that. And it was actually, horrendous because Joy had gone on um, a, um, a tour, a tour where she did talks all around the world. She did that all the time and raised money for wildlife and so forth. She was quite amazing in that way. Um, and George was in camp and his camp, where that grave is, his camp's just along the river, a little way down, their camp was there, with a great big tree under which she used to paint her art, wonderful paintings. And um, we always go because when Joy had gone on her trip, um, Elsa sort of behaving rather strangely. And then she went into the river, which as I've just said, was flowing nearby. And she sort of collapsed in the water and George called his, his two chaps to come and help him. And the three of them carried her, lugged her literally out of the river and she collapsed on George's knees. And suddenly, apparently, she got up from lying with her head on his knees and gave a great roar and dropped dead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she had cubs. She'd mated with a wild lamb. She truly was a wild lamb. But she was a lambness of two worlds because she never, never forgot or abandoned her human friends. 
So she was a human, a land of landness of two worlds. And Joy, of course, was completely in bits because she'd been away and she hadn't been with her. And she doted on that Elsa. She really did. Mm. So we always go to Elsa's grave when we when we go to Kenya, when we go to Meru. That's one of our special things. I mean, I hope one day I might be able to go back. Who knows? But I certainly hope so. I. I I think yeah I think we'll um we'll have to try and arrange that because <clears throat> Meru is an incredibly special place yes. and um what what an in, what an incredible to hear it firsthand from you what an incredible story I know like, thank you again it's, for sharing it not at all um yeah. the thing is that as I think I did say earlier I can't quite remember that both the Adamsons were killed by people not by animals which everyone would say and yes George, when he continued his work in the adjoining reserve called Cora, which is where Christian the Lion was returned to the wild and many other lands as well, um, he was actually killed by pe people coming across the river to graze their cattle in the park because they wanted the, the park for their cattle and he was in the way with his wretched lions, you see. So right. he also he was shot and yeah. he buried, he's buried there with um, about three other lands. One is Christian and, no, sorry, not Christian. Christian went off. It's, it's Boy and Super Cub and one other, all buried. No, Christian had disappeared one day back to the wild and George always used to say, uh, he's gone to find his own pride, make his own life. And uh, he didn't come back, but he was with George for about three years. I'm sorry I made a mistake there. I muddled up with the names of everything. I do that all the time. And I talk, uh, speaking of um, Elsa, um, we spoke earlier of Ingrid and Rudy, who run uh, Nature Help Centrum in Belgium, which is where King, among others, many of many of the oh, lions of have rescued, the halfway such house. Such a wonderful place run by such special people. Absolutely. And they're, they're on now. And Ingrid has just said oh. in a comment, one of our cats is named after Elsa and one is called Virginia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very honoured. <laughs> I can't imagine anything nicer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wonderful. Um, and so let's have some more, some more happy endings. Here's, this doesn't look like a, a, a happy beginning. Who, who no, is that here? A very, very unhappy beginning. It's in Ethiopia now. And um, we'd heard through the department of the government dealing with wildlife issues and all that stuff about this lion who had been kept in a shed for four years on a chain i think you can see the chain yes yes he'd been tied on that chain for four years and the authorities heard about this and said oh please we need him rescued he must be rescued and uh, we said, well, we'd just love to rescue him, but we've got nowhere to put him. And so, could you let us build a sanctuary? So, they said yes. So that's where our Ethiopian sanctuary, at Ancesakote, he went into a halfway house, a, a nice large enclosure with, a, with an indoor house for, it must have been about 10 months or something like that, 10, 11 months while all this was being done. So he left this ghastly place. He was no longer on the chain. And I had the greatest privilege of the day he was going to leave from his pen, a halfway house pen, to go to, as a go to the sanctuary. I was given the key to, to unlock the padlock. And I, I treasure that, all these moments you treasure forever, opening that door so that he could be lifted. He was sedated, of course, lifted up and put into the vehicle to drive back um, into Addis Ababa and then north to, to the sanctuary. And there he is. And there's a, there he is. Look, oh, he only died last year. And look at him. Isn't he beautiful? Stunning. And fr and as you said, as close to free as he could ever be, given his circumstances. Thanks to you guys. Yeah. It's just marvelous. He was actually given a lady friend, but <laughs> not very interested in each other. So they just lived together but didn't really connect much, which I thought was quite nice to have the choice, really. Yep, lovely that he had a companion and look at how yeah. healthy and happy yes. and content he is. The difference in body, as you, you mentioned before, um, 
with um, with one of the other lines that we saw, the, you can just see it in the physicality, in the body language, the difference between a, a depressed animal and a happy, relaxed, vivacious animal. It's night but and day. You, it's all thanks to you, guys. Too, you see that, but human body language is very revealing, I always think. Mm. We don't pay enough attention to that. We're, we're sort of focused on what they're saying or, or their personality, but sometimes the body language can tell another story, can't it? It's, it can indeed. In fact, they say more than more than the words do, and, the, yeah. and with with humans. So certainly in animals, it's um, it's a very powerful and very apparent thing. Um, who are these little guys we're looking at? Oh, these are the, the little lions of Lyon, and uh, they all <clears throat> came from different places in France. Lyon in France is where where this picture is taken, sort of halfway house again. Lots of halfway houses. Um, yes, one was found on a little child's bed in a flat. One was found in Paris. One was found in a garage in Marseille in the south of France. One was found in the boot of a car on the Champs-Élysées. The, the driver or the owner of the car and the lion uh, stopped people and asked them if they would like to have their photo taken with this little cub and, and to please you know, give us a little bit of thank you. And the other one uh, was handed in, in fact, because um, it wasn't at all well. And the owner thought he would probably die. And then goodness knows how is he going to bury it because he's not meant to have it in the first place. And so they were all brought together. And here they are in Lyon in the um, in a little sanctuary part of, a, of an establishment there waiting to go to Shamwari. And here they are at Shamwari. Here they are in Shamwari, and look at that beautiful, well, the four beautiful faces and the beautiful surroundings, which literally is their natural habitat. It's just that it's, in, they have enclosures, don't they? Large, large enclosures. You can only barely make out the fence line in the background there, but they have as close to their natural habitat and freedom as they can ever possibly hope for, and it's all thanks to you guys again. Oh, I just, it's very joyful to see them, and looking so well, you see, beautifully looked after, wonderful vet, Johan Joubert, a uh, wonderful team there. Um, they're just all such incredible people. <laughs> Can't thank them enough for all they do. It, it is a huge yeah. team effort, isn't it? Uh, for absolutely years, and he just loves the animals so much. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and having had the privilege, which we'll actually get to in a little moment, in a moment, I'm going to share, share a little video with you guys of, of my own experience of this kind of thing. Oh. Um, and uh, I've, I've had firsthand experience of just how many people, just how much is involved. And and least not, for those of you watching, you guys, because you, you make it possible. The, the, yes. There's an enormous cost associated with all of this. Um, and, and the logistics are gigantic. And, I, you know, I'll talk a little bit about it myself uh, when, we, when we talk about King. But it is, as you just said, um, Johan Joubert and, as a vet, the vet there, and, and Chris Draper from Born Free and Maggie and all the the whole team from the very and and, and Ingrid and Rudy over at, uh, at the, yeah. the halfway house sanctuary in Belgium and Maggie from the the Born Free team. We've got such a fantastic team, right. all completely loyal and devoted, you know, to what we yeah. do. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I I I hear I hear you loud and clear in terms of the, as you quite rightly say, it's a, it is a team effort and. Um, and it's an ongoing thing. And and so we've seen some examples of the stories that are unfolding or have unfolded in the in the past, and all of them have happy ending. And 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 sadly, as much as I, I wish I could tell everybody that that's a thing of the past, it still happens today. And in actual fact, while this will have a happy ending, this is something that's happening right now, isn't it? That's right, it is, yes. These are ex circus lands. And, um, view. Sorry, I'm just going to zoom in for a bit of a better view for you oh, guys. Yeah. You can see the lions in there. Now they're going to Shamwari, but you see the trouble is now with shutdown or lockdown, or whatever it's called, there aren't any planes really. But once the planes start, these four will go to Shamwari, and they're fully grown. I mean, they're big lions. Yeah. And this is a circus in France. Yes, I think it was a circus in France. I, I'm not quite sure about that. I'll have to right. find out. Um, I think it was a circus in France. Will might be able to fill in yeah. that. 
Probably, um, yeah, and, well, and, and regardless of where they're from and what their situation, it's about to drastically improve as soon as the lockdown lifts and, and we're able to uh, to, fr to fly me, freely. Yeah, be fine. This is one of, I chose this photograph, it just shows you where they lived in once, but they don't now, they've got sort of little little pens and enclosures and things. They're not living in that. It's just one of the pictures I chose because yes. it shows yes. another aspect of what they go through. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I'm going to do, because obviously we will at some stage in the not too distant future have a very happy ending, no doubt, to share of those four lions as well. But um, as I've alluded to, I've had the very great honor of, of being able to experience this kind of relocation and rescue firsthand and so while i'm I'll, I'll, i will play it without sound but i'll play the video of the it's only a couple of minutes long and in the background you'll see the the journey that that actually uh king was taking uh which i had the great privilege of being involved in i mean it was to, to this day i mean people often ask me the question um as to what conservation stories or or animal encounters stick with me the most and this alongside meeting sudan the last remaining when he was still alive the last remaining male northern white rhino are the, are the most profound things i've ever ever had the privilege of of experiencing and i'm going to share this with you guys and so you'll see a little bit of um of how that journey went and i can explain it to an extent as well if uh if I can find the video, because it's just vanished on me, which is nice, but we'll find it. Uh, but w w Virginia, while I'm looking for this video, are you able to share, um, is, are there any particular rescues, any particular uh, relocations of a particular animal? I, mean, I know that they all matter so much to you and that they all, they all, they all are important, each of the animals as per, compassionate conservation they all matter just as much as each other but are there any particularly profound memories and fond memories that stick out for you in terms of any of these these relocations and rescues that you've been involved in oh my goodness i mean there must be so many as well well there are there are quite a lot over the years many <laughs> but well, as you're in a way Please carry um, on. No, one of the one of the rescues, actually, we've already spoken about, which was the first off the roof in Tenerife. Right, because right. Because it combined everything that is wrong, so terribly wrong, and then that you haven't got the chance if you carry on trying, you can change it, you can make it better, and then. On the way, you meet wonderful people, you see, who enable you to make it better. And it's, it's never one person. It's like, drop, drop, that person does that. Then that person arrives. And then, oh, that person's turned up. It's like, it's just, it's a, it's a team thing. I think I've always thought of us as a team at Born Free. It's, it's never about one person. It's about one animal often, but it's not about one person. It's everyone in that team has a role and if you take that person out of the team, that role, right. that position will be wanting. So you must guard your people as much as you care for your lions and your leopards and your tigers. You must care for the people as well who do the work. Really tough work sometimes. Really tough. And I've, I've, as I say, I'm, I found the video, thankfully, and I'll play it for you guys. And I can tell you from being involved in it that it it's something that is is – executed with military precision and as virginia says if if one element of that operation is removed the whole thing could very easily fall apart and and this is this is the example i had the privilege of of witnessing so this is the the, the this is not this is not what i thought it was <laughs> it's very nice though it's a lovely that's the that was the video of springwood sanctuary which is actually very lovely yeah so let me i apologize for that i'm just gonna i'm gonna stop sharing my screen again we can just keep talking for a bit longer while I find this video of King, which has just for some reason done a vanishing act, but we will find it. We will find it. Um, but um, Virginia, you know, one of the other things that, that I wanted to ask you is that 
you've you've been involved in this for decades. You've been doing. I mean, there's, uh, obviously, it started as Zoo Check. It evolved into Born, the Born Free Foundation. But you've been doing it for decades, and over that period of time, you d directly Born Free have been directly involved in some great victories, some incredible achievements, some milestones, legislative change, things like the fact that we don't have dolphin area in the UK anymore. We don't have, I think, other than one that remains circuses. Are there, what, are, what are the kind of milestones that you're most proud of, that you're most pleased have happened over the course of your time yeah, in conservation? I'm really thankful for, rather than proud, probably. Um, Perfect. Well, the, the dolphin rescue, we did two lots of dolphin rescues over the years. One in the early 60s, the, the last three dolphins in captivity in this country, two at Brighton, dolphin area, and one in Morecambe up north. Right. And uh, the opposition was ginormous. I mean, we, we were opposed um, by people who like dolphins in captivity. Uh, it was a very difficult rescue, and actually Will was there, and so understood and saw it all and it was challenging to say the least but we managed to get them we flew the dolphins to the turks and caicos islands and um we built a, an enormous sea pen where they could acclimatize for several months so they got used to eating live fish because in, in captivity they don't eat live fish they eat dead fish of course so yeah. they had to learn to catch fish and all that's i mean it's it's, it's it's going back, to, it's going to school, isn't it? It's learning the lessons. And then one day, uh, one day, Rocky gone ahead, I think I'm right in saying, and Missy and Silver followed. So Rocky was already there and they joined him. I think I'm right remembering that. And, um, and so they were introduced to each other and there's plenty of places they could swim away if they didn't want to meet that day. Um, and then one day, Will and I went out there for the release into the ocean. I should never forget it. We were in a, in a separate, they, 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 they'd made a sea pen right out there and the three dolphins were there waiting and then we went out in a little boat and then someone pulled up the gate like this and they swam out into, the, into freedom. Huh. And they were, they were tagged so they could be uh, followed on the little, whatever you call it, I'm so untechnical, the little thing. The little I know what you mean. You know what I mean. And um, so, and... For a, while, a long while, they were followed, and we saw them, and everything was fine. And then one day, whether the thing fell off or whatever, but they at least had some freedom, even if it was six months. They'd had six months of freedom, and I'm sure there was more. And the other time, the second time, was in Turkey. There was this ghastly swimming pool in, in which these dolphins were kept by a Russian gentleman. Right. Way of naming him, really. Person. And um, it was absolutely horrible. Helen Worth, wonderful Helen Worth, went out and did a little piece near the pool looking at them. Right. And, uh, a wonderful team of local people started a fund to save them. And we went out, and so we worked with the local people, and we built a sea pen again. And they were transferred. We bought them, and they were transferred into, um, into the... Um, into the pen where they again fed live fish and all the rest of it and we went again and that was filmed also so in fact my youngest son dan who's a, um, a water cameraman he came out and he filmed them swimming out of the side of the to freedom oh i mean you can't make those things up it, it's so uplifting and wonderful you know absolutely it's invaluable misery and the pain when you see them in horrible places is the joy if you ever get them out of them so the balance is there not always but often uh, absolutely and i'm delighted to share now that i have actually got it and, oh, you've got it. and in 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 my um in my bid to uh <laughs> to share this with you guys i i accidentally started to play having just literally just said let's take a look at uh, King the lion and and what if, if Jackie Howe is watching my last guest she'll have suddenly seen the Springwood sanctuary in in East Sussex appear and don't worry Jackie there isn't a lion in your horse sanctuary um, <laughs> that was a mistake but but what you're going to see now is my journey to uh, to sh the Shamwari big cat sanctuary uh, the born free big cat sanctuary I should say at the Shamwari game reserve 
Um, I think it was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? It was 2018, it must have been. A year and a half or something like that. Right, right. So, and here, here, here is when I first met King at the, the Nature Help Centrum that we've been talking about with Ingrid and, and Rudy. And essentially what we did was we took them by road back to Heathrow, from Heathrow to Nairobi, Nairobi to um, Joburg. And this is where we've just stopped. We just landed in Nairobi, which was the longest stretch of the journey, which was, we, this is King's traveling crate. And Chris Draper, you'll see in a moment, uh, they're just checking on King uh, midway through the journey. It was an epic, maybe 36 hour journey. This is the small plane that we had to leave King on a separate plane to Port Elizabeth by road from Port Elizabeth. And here we are now going to Shamwari uh, this is me driving through Shamwari to the to the Born Free Big Cat Sanctuary that morning that King is going to be released. Here r arrives King. So this is this this is in the space of two minutes. You guys are seeing this, but this is an epic year long operation of military precision, as Virginia was saying. There, his crate is being loaded next to the the release gate, and here is the moment that King steps onto African soil, into the oh. African sunshine for the very first time in his young life. Mm. And there he, and he was so bold and so proud and look at him, he just, he just steps out and owns his environment instantly. And that is, that's his home, that's where he is to this day. And I'm so happy to share with you that because of Born Free, King went from this in a Paris apartment being underfed in a dog kennel to this photograph from March this year is King. And, and not only kept in that horrible condition, Dan, but also the owner videoed himself kicking him. He used to kick him like a football. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you can't make it up, can you? You can't make it up. And thankfully, he was, he was stupid enough to put it on the internet and hence yep. it led to his capture and King's, uh, King's, eventual uh, relocation to his ancestral home in that beautiful environment that you just saw. And I, I was in touch with Glenn and Catherine, who, who were part of your team there, who just do the most incredible job. Um, I've just been in touch with them in the last couple of days just to double check on the latest updates about King. And it's so beautiful to hear that last image that you just saw of King. Yeah. is uh, He is now a healthy, happy, what they're describing, t teenager. He's... <laughs> He's a, he's a proper lion now, as you just saw, but he still has a playful side and he loves to splash in his water and he loves to take his food and sit on top of his, his little um, wooden structure and watch his, on, his, on top of his platform, that's right, and, just, and he likes to eat looking at his surroundings. So he is now a lion and no longer, and never again will he suffer the kind of abuse that he, he suffered in the beginning of his, his, his little precious life. And that is an example of, the, the, and the one example that I had the utter privilege of being involved in, that's an example of what Born Free does over and over again. And so to you and Bill and Will, all those years ago, sitting around your dining room table and starting Zoo Check with a pound each, yeah. to where yes, we are today with all of these stories. But Just you know, we have such loyal supporters. We've got people still with us from those first days, handful yeah still with us it's fantastic and of course now all these issues are very much in the forefront of young people's minds that's what mm. i think is exciting so many young yeah. eager yeah. people to, to carry on this because i mean you know as we start tottering on speaking for myself i mean we want the young minds and the young energy to come in and you're still so young dan you're fine you'll be raring to go again soon won't you off to africa on another rescue or something I, I, at the first opportunity, I wish I was. I wish I was as young as you made me sound. But I, I will, be, regardless, I'll be going to Africa, and I'll be doing everything I can to convince you to come with me. So, we'll see if we can make that happen. Yeah, um, Virginia, thank you so much for sharing these stories with us. It's just extraordinary to be able to talk to you like this, and I know that it's a, a gift to me personally, and to so many of the people who've been watching this. And, and there are many, and there's so many comments. Uh, you know, just it's it's so beautiful to see how the outpouring of love and support for you and for the foundation and for Will and everything that you guys stand for and all of the animals that you've that you've rescued over the years. I mean, it's it's absolutely staggering what you've achieved, and it's and we're all so grateful. We really are. Thank you. Well, you're very generous in what you say, Dan, and 
as I said before, probably more than once, you, you, you're not alone. You can't do it alone, you see. You can drop a little seed here, which someone else will pour water on and it'll grow. But someone else has put the water on. So it's a, it's a team thing. It always is I like agree. I agree. I agree. And I, and I will give you that, but I'm going to, but I am going to have to put my foot down and no. say, I'm going to have to say that there are certain, and I, because I know I speak for not just myself, but for many people who are, who will be watching this now or later, that there are people in the world whose very presence gives you reassurance and hope and inspiration. And that you, Virginia McKenna, are one of those people. And we thank you so much from the bottom of our heart for being who you are and standing for what you stand for. We adore you. And, um, and you've, you've, you've shone such a beautiful light for us, and we, which we can follow. You know, we get to follow your example. Well, you're very kind, but I mean, I have to thank my wonderful Bill and Will for being in it from the beginning and for Will still carrying it forward in his amazing, modest way. Mm. Well, I know where he gets that from. And your humility is, uh, is, uh, is in equal measure and, and equally inspiring. And Virginia, I, I love you to bits and I thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for inviting me on your program. Thank you for being on it. And um, for, for everybody else, um, I will be back on Tuesday at 7 p.m. with Mr. Philip Limbury, the CEO of Compassion in World Farming which is a very important conversation that we will be having. Um, so please do join us then. But for tonight, I, I just want to, again, Virginia, thank you for everything that you do. And we, you, you have my wholehearted, lifelong support in what you do and what the Born Free Foundation does. And thank you so much for sharing all of this with us tonight. It's been an incredibly special experience for me and for everybody. Well, you're a fantastic person to talk to because you sort of very subtly and gently sort of draw it out i think you're amazing well i think you are and this is about you so thank you virginia oh, thank, thank you, you. and i'll look forward to seeing you very soon i've got a number of hugs to deliver to you Ooh. when i do see you so prepare yourself for that there's at okay. least 45 people who've said to me yeah, they thought oh. that i might be seeing you for this in interview and they said please give her a hug from me so oh, here we are here we are <laughs> my friends thank you so much for, for watching i hope you've um You've treasured this experience as much as I have, and um, we'll see you on Tuesday, Virginia. Thank you, and good night. Good night. Bye-bye.